Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the QBI SPI seminar today. It's an absolutely great pleasure to have Trevor Bivona as a speaker here. Trevor is professor of medicine uh, at the University of California, San Francisco. He's uh, a clinician scientist. We need more of those. Uh, he did his uh, medical and PhD degrees at the NYU School of Medicine, then uh, did some training at the Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School in Boston. Uh, also passed through, through <clears throat> Memorial Sloan Kettering, so he's been at all the big cancer institutions. And uh, he's currently a professor at the Department of Medicine and also in the Helen Tiller UCSF Comprehensive Can Cancer Center. And he really does very exciting research at the interface between clinics and um, laboratory research. And he also won a NIH Director's New Innovator Award and is an elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. So I'm very much looking forward to your talk, Trevor, and I'll pass over to you. Thank if you have you any much. questions at the end, please put them in the Q&A or chat box. Sorry, you. I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, it's nice to be here. Thank you so much, Walter, um, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure uh, to, to join you all today, and, and thanks to those who are joining. Um, so I'm actually uh, going to present um, a little bit of a different body of work than, than I had originally planned, but I, I'd love some feedback on this. It's a, it's a bit of a new area, um, we think, in, in not only in my lab, but perhaps in, in cancer biology in general. Um, and, and the story that I'll share with you today and, and the findings are really um, uh, derivative and, and um, uh, grew out of our work in drug resistance, but this is not really going to be a drug resistance uh, uh, sort of talk today. So um, I'm going to talk today about um, our longstanding interest and in recent findings uh, with regard to understanding uh, the, the receptor tyrosine kinase and RAS pathway signaling um, in, in cancer. So uh, this is the um, publication that, 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 um, um, that came out of our group and collaborators, Bo Wong and, and many others, uh, a few months ago last year. I'm going to share with you some of the main findings um, of this work and, and also some unpublished data uh, that, that we've um, uh, obtained more recently. Um, and so through a series of serendipitous uh, observations, um, uh, the, the body of work I'll present to you today, and again, would love feedback. Um, is that we, we stumbled into a, what we think is a new mechanism for receptor tyrosine kinase and RAS pathway signaling in cancer, at least. Um, and that's through uh, not lipid membrane compartments, but, but actually a biomolecular condensate or a protein granule uh, that is formed by certain oncogenic RTKs. And this granule, which is sh uh, shown here, this is an anaplastic lymphoma kinase uh, chimeric fusion granule, uh, high resolution imaging uh, by Bo Wong, um, can actually organize oncogenic RAS pathway signaling from this cytoplasmic, mem membraneless cytoplasmic uh, localization. And, and I'll walk you through our, uh, the background and, and how we uh, came to that conclusion um, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So as we all know, uh, you know conventional uh, RTK signaling and, and, and RAS signaling occurs on lipid membrane compartments. That's just schematically uh, uh, represented here in an oversimplified um, uh, pathway diagram. Uh, so uh, cells use uh, obviously, lipid memory compartments to organize uh, biological processes and signal. And so, what I'm showing here is just an oncogenic RTK, it could be a native wild type RTK as well, of course. Um, and, and this uh, RTK is a transmembrane spanning uh, protein, obviously activated by ligand or, or, or oncogenic mutations, and uh, uh, re uh, recruits uh, localized signaling complexes to initiate um, uh, downstream signaling, such as through the RAS pathway. In addition to lipid membrane compartments, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's a, a different way that, uh, uh, that cells can, can organize uh, biological processes and, 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 and some signaling uh, pathways. And that is through biomolecular condensates or, or, or phase separated compartments. Uh, classically, these are, um, uh, these are um, uh, organelles such as pea bodies or stress granules or pea granules. And uh, they're really uh, protein um, based um, organelles with devoid of, of lipid membranes in, in general. Um, and uh, often, often these classic um, uh, condensates contain uh, nucleic acid RNA, uh, but very frequently as well. And again, this is a way to, to concentrate um, and, and organize, uh, uh, concentrate proteins and organize biological processes. Um, the role of um, uh, condensates um, is well established, obviously in a variety of uh, physiologic conditions, and in some cases, pathologic conditions as well. Although their role in, in cancer really is just beginning to emerge, and, and we think um, the RTK mechanism that that um, uh, that um, uh, that we found maybe one um, uh, new class 
uh, of these contexts in, in, in itself. So what is the underlying um, uh, mechanism of condensate um, uh, biology? It really is this concept of protein-protein interactions, but, but not dimers or trimers, very high order protein interactions. And so I'm just showing that in again, an oversimplified schematic diagram here. Hopefully you can see the laser pointer um, where uh, proteins often contain, uh, often containing oligomerization or multi-immunization domains are, are able to self-assemble um, into a, a very large higher order protein-protein interaction network. Um, again, through these um, oligomerization or multi-immunization domains. And, and um, I'll come back to those in the case of the RTK, oncogenic RTKs in, in a couple of slides. And, and uh, this then um, allows for the concentration of effector molecules. Um, and um, what I'll be focusing on for the RTKs that, that I'll be discussing today uh, is um, uh, adapter proteins that, that activate the RAS pathway, for example, and initiate that tiny signaling downstream. Through, uh, that'll be the major effector pathway I'll focus on. And um, in the context of cancer, this um, effector protein-protein uh, interaction network and effector um, interaction uh, then is able to initiate uh, uh, a proliferative or oncogenic, oncogenic signal. And so um, uh, it really is the, the, the higher order protein-protein uh, um, interaction network that's required uh, for the ultimate biological output of, of condensates. So how did we um, um, become uh, uh, in, in, um, uh, interested in the condensate field? Well, it really was, uh, work um, by a former graduate student many years ago, um, uh, uh, Gorian Yustanovich, uh, who uh, was studying a translocation of chimeric fusion oncoprotein uh, that I've already alluded to, anaphylactic kinase. The oncogenic form of this in lung cancer and many other cancers um, is uh, um, a structural uh, gene rearrangement by, by virtue of a chromosomal translocation that essentially um, creates a, a fusion protein uh, that contains the kinase domain of the anaphylactic lymphoma kinase, or ALK. Uh, fused to a five prime binding partner uh, or, or intermodal binding partner, EML4. Um, there are many other um, uh, um, uh, 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 intermodal binding partners for ALK and other um, chimeric um, uh, uh, fusion oncoproteins and cancers. And I'll come back to a couple of those later in the talk. Uh, but the general principle is that, um, uh, is that um, uh, by virtue of the chromosomal translocation, uh, the transmembrane domain and the extracellular domain of the kinase of the RTK here, in this case, ALK, uh, is, um, is, is not included, it's absent from the chimeric fusion of the protein. And so what Goran uh, was studying in, in his, uh, uh, during his PhD thesis was just the, the signaling mechanisms downstream that were operating in the context of this chimeric fusion of the protein. He was not necessarily studying the localization or what I'm gonna be discussing today. But one of the observations he made um, was uh, through subcellular uh, localization experiments, uh, where he simply um, was interested in understanding where this, you know, where this fusion oncoprotein resides in cells. And what he had found was that it did not reside on, uh, at the cell surface or um, on, the, on the plasma membrane. It resided in these cytoplasmic punctate structures that I'm showing here in, in um, eye magnification. Um, and, um, and, and through structure function studies, uh, what he found was that actually there was a, a key determinant uh, in the N-terminal uh, uh, fusion partner, EML4 here, that was required for this discrete cytoplasmic punctate uh, localization of the, of the, uh, of the full-length chimeric fusion oncoprotein. And so if he mutated this, uh, one of the domains in this, pro in this um, uh, component of the fusion, uh, the help domain, what he found was that this localization was, uh, was abrogated. The protein was still expressed, but it was now diffusely expressed in the cytosol as shown here. And perhaps what's more important about this finding is that uh, um, when he examined signaling in this context, uh, of course, the down, uh, the RASPAP kinase signaling pathway was um, was was on in the context of the, the native full length, and in fact, the, the point of this paper and this thesis work was essentially um, that this was the sort of the major pathway operating downstream of this chimeric fusion of the protein. Um, and when this was uh, mislocalized by virtue of this help domain mutation, uh, that greatly diminished uh, oncogenic signaling down the the RASPAP kinase uh, pathway. So the localization. In, in, in these punctate structures in the cytoplasm was required for the oncogenic signaling, at least down, uh, down this particular effector pathway, which he had shown was the major effector pathway in the context of, of this particular uh, oncogene. And so why this is interesting, and, and uh, this was sort of left, and his paper was published, and, and this observation was, was in the paper, but was not further explored. Um, but what's interesting about this observation is that I, which is something I already alluded to, is that um, because of the, the, the genomic, re, the character of the genomic rearrangement, there is no obvious membrane targeting uh, domain in the, in the chimeric fusion like protein. The transmembrane domain is absent um, uh, from the fusion. And so um, in, 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 um, in, in a bit of just curiosity-driven science in this context, we simply, um, uh, in, in taking the project forward, 
uh, set out to understand what was the identity of the subcellular structure. And our initial hypothesis was um, that perhaps it's an endosome or some sort of you know, internal membrane, lipid membrane compartment. So in, um, in, in um, examine, beginning to examine the, uh, the hypothesis further, we first uh, examined uh, localization uh, of uh, EML4 alk in, in, in human tissues. And this is a, a patient-derived lung cancer cell line, uh, human lung cancer cell line. Uh, that, that contains, uh, uh, endogenously contains this chromosomal translocation. Um, and uh, indeed, we, we found um, that in this sort of native state, um, that the, 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 uh, this uh, fusion acoprotein was localized to these uh, cytoplasmic um, uh, uh, structures here, shown uh, here by this white arrow. Um, we could reproduce this by obviously expressing um, the, the, uh, the chimeric fusion oncoprotein um, at, at, um, at moderate levels. Um, and here's an example in a bronchial epithelial line where we express um, a flag tag form of EML4 alk here, and then we can recapitulate this. You see it both in the endogenous as well as the express system. Of course, the endogenous is important for obvious reasons. The express allows us to conduct mechanistic and, and, um, and structure function studies. So having these systems available was, uh, was quite, um, and reproducible was, um, was an important tool. So having um, validated that this, uh, this structure uh, existed in, in, in these systems, including endogenously. Um, we then uh, conducted a series of uh, sub-biological experiments uh, to, again, tr uh, try to identify what, what the structure was. And so um, it, our first hypothesis was with the membrane-based structure, an internal membrane structure. So we uh, labeled various membranes or membrane compartments with, um, with, with known established uh, markers for, for a variety of, of them. And I'm just showing a subset of them here. Uh, uh, there was a battery of, of, of 10 to 12 uh, internal membrane uh, structures that we examined. Um, so first, we found no evidence of, of co-localization with just the generic lipid membrane dye, uh, either um, uh, marking the cell surface here or uh, internal membrane structures. And um, so that the, um, uh, the the lipid membrane um, uh, markers are in, in green here, in GFP, um, and the uh, EMF4 alk here is in magenta. Again, you can see the cyto the cytoplasmic punctate here. Um, and this is essentially, we're, we're, we're all negative data. So uh, early endosome, late endosome, lysosome, not shown here, mitochondria um, and other uh, internal membrane organelles uh, did not have any appreciable co-localization uh, with these uh, uh, with these with these uh, granules. Um, similarly, uh, we use subcellular fractionation to examine the, the character um, of, of these structures, and so. Um, uh, what we um, uh, what we set out uh, to do was um, was to essentially uh, uh, solubilize um, uh, uh, these lipid membranes with, uh, with 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 the standard detergent here, Triton. Um, and in the context of a, of a lipid membrane uh, protein, of course, uh, the, uh, the the membrane will move from the pellet into the supernatant upon upon detergent solubilization, as shown here for the control EGFR, which is plasma membrane bound. Also for Camexin, ER membrane bound here, so you can see the shift from the pellet to the supernatant. Um, and what we found in contrast was that emf did not behave in that manner. And in fact, it was detergent insoluble and, uh, and behaves uh, similarly to uh, and, uh, DCP1B, which is a, a, a P body uh, model. And so, again, a, a, a classic uh, sort of biomarker conic that's devoid of lipid membranes. So, altogether, these data started to hint at the possibility that perhaps this was a membraneless organelle and uh, did not contain uh, lipid membrane structures. And so, we started to Examine that hypothesis, um, which was unanticipated in our, in our minds, um, uh, 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 further. So um, we next set out to, um, in collaboration with Bo Wong's group at UCSF, uh, uh, characterize the uh, biophysical nature of, of this uh, structure. Um, and so he conducted uh, super resolution imaging um, on uh, both endogenous and expressed DMO4 alk in cells in situ. Um, and what he found um, by super resolution imaging was the structure appeared uh, uh, like this in the, in the native state uh, is quite um, uh, a peculiar structure, even for a biomolecular condensate. It certainly is not well circumscribed. It is curvilinear and porous. It contains quite a bit of surface area, um, and it's got a, a very serpiginous um, a sort of character to it, as you can see here. Um, and it appears as though cytosol is actually baiting not only the surface area here, but, but certain channels um, that, that exist um, uh, in this structure that's formed in situ in the, in the cytoplasm. These are just two different views of, of one of the granules. Um, <clears throat> we conducted um, um, some fluorescence-based analysis to, to understand, the, 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 again, the, 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 the um, biophysical properties of these structures. And so one classic approach in the cognitive field is to conduct fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching or FRAP, and, and those studies are shown here. And this essentially allows us to, to measure the recovery time and how, and how um, uh, 
uh, mobile or, um, uh, or diffusible the EMR uh, is in the cytoplasm in the context of these structures. And we actually found by, uh, by FRAP studies, as, as many of you uh, may appreciate here by these traces, is that there was a, a very slow recovery time, suggesting that these are relatively um, uh, uh, relatively solid-like, um, uh, not solid, um, uh, perfectly solid, but it's more solid-like rather than more liquid-like granules. And, and many of you who study conifers or in the field may, may know uh, that this is a, a very much a, uh, uh, there can be a, a very um, uh, uh, broad range uh, of properties. So many conifers are more liquid-like and, and others are more solid-like um, and, and there's a spectrum in between. And I'll come back to that in, in, in a few minutes uh, because there are other RTK fusions that form similar structures, as I'll show you. And, and those other fusions actually um, uh, have, have varied um, uh, liquid-like versus uh, solid-like uh, states. So all of this, uh, these, these findings suggested that, that perhaps um, you know, the, the, the possibility that, that, that these RTK fusions were forming um, uh, um, membraneless cytoplasmic organelles um, that, that might organize signaling, uh, you know, there was a real uh, possibility. And so that posed some fundamental um, uh, 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 questions, all biological questions. Um, so how could, for example, RASMAP kinase signaling emanate from, from these structures, you know, from EMR4 alpha? We had shown, and other groups have also shown that it's, it's a major pathway downstream of EMR4 alpha. And yet, as many of you know, and I introduced earlier in, in, in a few slides ago, uh, classically, you know, RAS, RTK and RAS pathway signaling requires a lipid membrane structure, but most notably the plasma membrane to, to organize and initiate signaling. Um, many of you may may may, uh, may be aware that 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 actually, although um, uh, it, it's clear that that RAS most often requires a, a lipid membrane structure to productively signal, it's actually not a, a transmembrane protein, as, as as I'm sure most of you know. It's actually born; it's synthesized in the cytosol on, on free polysomes, and so it is by definition cytoplasmic when it is uh, is synthesized. It associates with membranes by virtue of a series of post-translational modifications that are, are summarized here in a review from Mark Phillips many years ago. Um, this is initiated by the C terminal, a C terminal uh, region uh, of RAS proteins um, called the hypervariable domain in the CAX box. This is the cysteine here in this CAX uh, box motif is lipidated, uh, crenulated. This uh, um, uh, occurs um, uh, in, uh, in the cytosol and that, and that allows for RAS trafficking to the endoplasmic reticulum and to the Golgi apparatus and then um, and into the plasma membrane in the case of H and NRAS. KRAS um, uh, uses a different mode of, of, of translocation, but yet still uh, transits through the endomembrane end end system. So this um, allowed this uh, 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 well-established paradigm um, uh, enabled us to, to hypothesize that perhaps perhaps these RTK structures in the, in the cytoplasm, in the case of these alpha fusions, might activate a cytosolic pool of RAS. And so if that's the case, one prediction is that um, uh, we would expect to find a RAS activating adapter proteins, um, such as the class of ones GRAB2 or GAB or, or SOS, the exchange factor, major exchange factor for, for RAS uh, proteins uh, that, that helps to load RAS with GTP, it's, it's active form. But we might expect to find these you know, in situ localized at these uh, cytoplasmic granules. And so we conducted um, uh, a series of uh, localization experiments here. So again, the emo 4 alk is shown in, in magenta here, forming the, the cytoplasmic granules. Um, these are a series of um, endogenously tagged um, uh, uh, lines. So this is endogenous GRAB2 tagged with anion green, uh, GAB1 and, and SOS1. You can see relatively diffuse localization in the cytoplasm uh, of these endogenous proteins as one might expect in the basal state uh, for the most part. Um, introduction of emo 4 alk here, uh, relocalizes these signaling proteins actually to the granules. And so here's GRAB2, uh, now forming these um, punctate structures that are, are overlaid with the EMOFL granules, and same with GAB1, and same with SOS1, and that's just quantified here. So a very large fraction is now relocalized upon introduction of this active uh, oncogenic fusion, RTK fusion protein. Um, this, um, this occurs also in the endogenous setting. I'm just showing you one of these uh, 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 RAS activating proteins, GRAB2 here, but you can see in the endogenous patient derived uh, um, uh, EMF or ALK cell line. Uh, that same one I showed you in, in several slides ago where ALK forms these granules endogenously. GRAB2 is also localized um, at, these, um, at these RTK granules. And interestingly, this is kinase um, uh, responsive and kinase dependent. Um, when, if one treats with an ALK inhibitor, this one is one of the FDA approved ALK inhibitors for the treatment of lung cancer, Prozotinib. It's an earlier generation inhibitor, not, not the major one used now in the clinic, uh, but just proof of principle that it, you know, treatment with this kinase inhibitor to diminish uh, alpha kinase activity um, uh, 
actually uh, results in loss of recruitment uh, of Brad2 GAB1 and SOS underneath the RAS activating complex here uh, to the granules. So this seems to be an, an active signaling process um, uh, based on these data. So uh, one of the, um, uh, uh, I think, relatively um, less appreciated aspects, again, of RAS biology is something I already alluded to, is that there's, there's actually a fairly abundant pool of, of cytoplasmic RAS. So it's, it's, um, uh, it certainly could be possible that, uh, that, that the cytoplasmic RAS, as opposed to membrane-associated RAS, could be an active signaling uh, molecule in the, uh, in the context, at least, of, of these uh, RTK fusion uh, granules. Um, and in fact, work by Mark Phillips and, and others has quantified um, the amount of, of RAS in, in different compartments of cells. And uh, for certain uh, isoforms of RAS, like NRAS, there can be up to 25 or 30 percent of the total pool of RAS in the, in the cell, uh, in the cytosol or cytoplasm at, at, any, at any one time. Of course, the majority is associated, with, uh, classically is associated um, with, uh, with lipid membrane compartments. Um, uh, but, but nonetheless, um, certainly uh, feasible that, that, uh, that there could be uh, active signaling by RAS. Uh, in, in certain contexts um, in, in the cytosol. And so we um, conducted a series of, of initial proof of principle experiments to examine whether, whether cytoplasmic RAS, uh, uh, instead of membrane associated RAS, might be uh, the active signaling species in the context of these our RTK cytoplasmic protein granules. And so we took advantage of a, a mutant in, in the RAS field that has been well characterized over decades, where that CAX box cysteine at the C terminus. Um, uh, of RAS proteins. In the case of KRAS, it's C185. Uh, if you mutate that to serine, there, there can be no prenylation of, of that cysteine and therefore uh, no trafficking and, and, and membrane association uh, of RAS. So this is uh, essentially locked in the cytosol um, in, 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 um, uh, in, in the context of, of this mutation. So it's a cyto purely cytosolic form of RAS by virtue of, the, of this mutant. So we simply asked whether uh, uh, membrane assisted RTKs or these R um, ALK, EMA4 ALK. Um, uh, oncoproteins that form cytoplasmic granules uh, uh, could, um, you know, could 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 activate um, uh, could activate RAS proteins. So here's the control on the left. This is just wild type native KRAS expressed in cells, and uh, here's the abundance of, of GTP. There's a basal state introduction of uh, either emo 4 alk or uh, oncogenic EGFR that's localized to um, to the plasma membrane predominantly. This can activate RAS, not surprisingly. Um, um, and um, what we found, which was the uh, more, a more interesting result, of course, was that in the context of the, of the cytosolic uh, mutant form of, of KRAS here, um, lipid membrane associated with EGFR was incapable of activating, uh, of activating um, again, this, this, um, uh, this cytosolic pool of RAS, as one might predict. Uh, but emo 4 alk um, was still able to, to activate. So again, suggesting that, that RAS activation could be occurring in situ uh, at these RTK granules here. Uh, and through a, a cytosolic uh, pool of, of RAS. And this was kinase uh, responsive. Uh, so if one treats, again, with prosotinib, the alkinase inhibitor, of course, in the wild type RAS context, you can diminish uh, RAS, the, the abundance of, of act, the active form of RAS, RAS GTP. Um, and this was also true in the context of, of the cytosolic mutant. So again, suggesting that these, the active RTK uh, alk fusion uh, granules were dynamically um, uh, activating RAS through, through the, uh, kinase activity and recruitment of of, of adapter proteins uh, of, uh, and, uh, to promote, um, again, uh, activation of the cytoplasmic pool of RAS here by virtue of this mutant. So we next turn to a cell biological recorder assay to, to more directly address this question of, of, of RAS activation in situ at, at the granules in the cytosol. Uh, there's a well-established series of probes in, in, in the RAS field that essentially allows for um, uh, uh, subserial localization of, of active RAS, RAS GTP. So this, um, these probes are based on uh, the RAS binding domain of the major, one of the major effectors of RAS, um, RAF1. Uh, and this is, it happens to be a tandem RAS binding domain, or RBD probe fused to GFP. Um, and so uh, this can essentially provide a, a, a live cell or, or, or fixed cell or readout of, of where, where the active pool of RAS is in cells. So here's the basal condition. Um, so it's the, the, the diffusely localized in the cytoplasm and the nucleus. You'll note there is nuclear accumulation of this probe. It's not because there's an active pool of RAS in the nucleus. That it, there appears to be um, uh, a cryptic nuclear localization signal. This has been um, well characterized, uh, not the NLS, but this phenomenon has been well characterized in the context of this probe. So it's merely a, a, a technical issue with the assay. But nonetheless, this probe faithfully uh, reports um, where active RAS is, um, when active RAS is present. Um, and so here's an oncogenic form of RAS. The RAS is localized mostly to the plasma membrane, a little bit of cytoplasmic localization here. Um, but you can see the, uh, the dramatic localization here uh, of the probe now uh, at the plasma membrane. 
right? again, we're pointing out um, uh, where uh, the predominant uh, species of, of, of active RAS is here in the context of this membrane bound form of, of KRAS that's oncogenic, NGT, NGTP loaded. So using this probe, where was um, where is RAS UTP in the context of the, these R2 expression of lema 4 l that forms these, these granules? Well, here are the granules of lema 4 l Again, the reporter alone is diffusely localized in those compartments I mentioned. And you can see actually a, a substantial relocalization now of the reporter, the RAS UTP reporter, uh, in situ to these granules. Again, suggesting uh, in a more direct experiment that, that in fact, um, RAS activation is occurring in situ in the cytoplasm at these membranous uh, compartments formed by by EMA4 out. Um, we conducted some specificity controls here. So um, by in introducing a dominant negative form of RAS into this, the, uh, these cells and, and using this assay diminishes uh, recruitment of, of uh, the, the probe, the ras UTP reporter probe, uh, uh, as, as one might predict if, again, if, if, um, if RAS is becoming activated in, in the cytosol here through GEF exchange, through SOS1 ex uh, GTP exchange. Uh, and uh, and and, and um, uh, there are some uh, well characterized mutants uh, in the RAS binding domain of RBD of RAF1 that abrogate RAS UTP binding. If we introduce those into the probe, uh, into the, the uh, GFP RBD probe, again, we diminish uh, signal, again, suggesting that this is a really a specific recruitment of, um, of, of the probe uh, to, um, to RAS GTP uh, that's accumulating uh, in, at, at or within these granules. So what is the mechanism by which um, these, uh, these granules uh, form and, and then initiate downstream signaling through, through the last pathway, for example, um, as well as potentially other pathways as well? Uh, we we uh, conducted a series of structure function uh, um, uh, studies to examine uh, the nature of, of the protein-protein interactions, the higher order assembly of these. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there is no obvious membrane targeting domain in, in, in these RTK fusions. Um, and so we uh, conducted um, uh, uh, a series of uh, mutagenesis studies to uh, test the hypothesis that perhaps some determinants, uh, not only within the kinase domain, but also in the N-terminal partner here, um, uh, might participate in higher order uh, assembly or formation of the granules. And we already had a clue that that might be the case because of Gorion's experiment seven years ago, not in the context of condensates, but but when he, if you recall, he, when he mutated the help domain, that rendered um, the protein uh, diffusely cytoplasmic and diminished signal. And so we sort of had a clue uh, that perhaps there were potentially other determinants that were contributing to um, uh, perhaps potentially protein-protein interaction networks that, that allow these granules to, to form. And so here's the native state. So here's the EMA4 out localized to the granules here on the left. If we mutate the kinase domain uh, of, of, of ALK in the context of this fusion, uh, uh, the, the granules are unable to form. And we actually found a similar result in the context of the help domain that's shown here. And that was not surprising. Again, this is just reproducing Gorion's original data uh, from several years ago. Um, but in addition, uh, we found an additional domain here, uh, the TD or the trimer a trimerization domain in the EMA4. Uh, also, a mutation of that also abrogates granular formation. Again, suggesting that, uh, that, that, that these are uh, protein protein interaction domains that allow for a higher order uh, assembly. And, and that's just sort of quantified here on the right for genomic effects. Uh, of each of these uh, mutations. When, uh, these, um, uh, when these mutations are introduced and the granules are unable to form, again, the protein is still expressed, it's just not ordered into these structures, um, uh, we lose the ability uh, to, um, to, to bind, uh, the RTK fusion then loses the ability to, to, to bind to um, adapters such as GRAB2, that's just shown here by co-IP experiments, so the wild type emo 4 elk binds to GRAB2, uh, and I, none of these mutants uh, is, um, is, is found in association with GRAB2 uh, when they're diffusely expressed in, in, in the cytoplasm. Again, suggesting that the formation of these structures is, is important for um, recruiting effect, uh, effective uh, molecules such as GRAB2 and others. Um, what we found also is that abrogation of, um, of this localization through these, each of these different mutants uh, also abrogates downstream signaling through the MAP kinase pathway, and that's just shown here through phospho-MEC and phospho -ERK western plots. Uh, so the wild type potently activates phospho -ERK and phospho -MEC, and that's not the case with either of these mutants. And perhaps that's not surprising in the context of the kinase domain mutants. We wouldn't expect a, a, um, a lack of kinase activity to be able to initiate downstream signaling. So in some ways, this is a, a positive control. Uh, but we also found that to be the case um, with these EMF4L derived, uh, EMF4 derived mutants as well, uh, the delta TD and the delta health mutants. So one interesting observation here um, is, is, um, is, is the kinase requirement for granular formation. Why would the kinase activity be required for granular formation? And one possibility and one hypothesis that we entertained was that perhaps 
um, uh, recruitment of additional um, um, proteins to an activated phosphorylated RTK tail, which would occur obviously um, in response to kinase uh, uh, activation and, and formation of these granules, perhaps recruitment of certain molecules, uh, adapter proteins might, might actually help uh, initiate or stabilize the granule in some way. And uh, elegant work by Ron Vail and Mike Rosen's uh, lab a couple of years ago, several years ago now, had shown that one of the molecules that, that, that um, is relevant to, to RTKs, GRAB2, um, is able to help uh, a certain uh, lipid membrane-based um, uh, signaling proteins, such as the T-cell receptor, to, to self-assemble. Again, not in the context of the cytoplasm, in the context of, uh, in the context of lipid membrane structures, um, but that the mechanism appeared to be potentially through, through, um, uh, through um, uh, the ability of GRAB2 to confer additional multivalency that allows for protein-protein for protein interactions of the nature required for higher order assembly in the context of lipid membranes. So our evidence clearly suggested and showed that, that GRAB2 is, um, is certainly is recruited in, in, into the granule and, and, uh, and participates in, in, in signaling. And so we tested the hypothesis that perhaps, perhaps the kinase activity requirement could be explained because of the requirement for the recruitment of GRAB2 to phosphorylated uh, tyrosine docking sites on, um, on the activated RTK tail of, of the MFRL. So the first experiment we conducted to test that hypothesis, and this is a busy slide, so I'll walk through this a bit slowly, but on the, here on the upper left, we simply silenced GRAB2 and other adapter proteins as, as well to determine if, um, if, if their expression was required for granular formation. And what's shown here is that in fact, GRAB2 is required. So silencing GRAB2 uh, greatly diminishes granular formation here in the context of the MFRL. Not the case for GAB1 and SOS. So there seems to be a specific role for certain uh, uh, recruitment of certain adapter proteins, such as GRAB2, but not, not all and not others. Um, and that um, through a series of um, engineering, a series of uh, established mutants uh, in, uh, within different domains of GRAB2 that are important for protein protein interactions. So, for example, SH2 and SH3 domains, which I'm sure you're all well familiar with, uh, through a series of, of sort of structure function studies here, uh, we found that in fact uh, there seems to be a role uh, primarily for the SH2 domain uh, in, uh, in, in participating in, 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 in granule assembly and, and formation. Again, presumably through. Uh, phospho uh, uh, docking of the SH2 domain of GRAB2 onto phosphorylated tyrosines within the C-terminal tail of activated uma 4 alk at the granules. And so I won't walk through all of these data, um, but I'll show you a couple of the slides, uh, image, uh, key images here. So the wild type ema 4 alk forms granules. If we silence GRAB2, um, uh, the ema 4 alk is unable to form uh, granules, that's just shown here. Uh, um, visual form, the same data here uh, was quantified earlier. And, um, and, and if we introduce a series of uh, a, a series of SH2 domain mutants, uh, most notably the, the RD6K, again, the granules are unable to form. There seems to be a, a minor role for the SH3 domain as well. So, um, and, and this is still an active area investigation, but, but, uh, but it appears as though the SH2 domain is critically important, uh, presumably, again, for conferring increased multivalency. So not only is emfr alk required, but recruitment, at least in this case, um, of, of, of adapters such as GRAB2, and, and based on uh, data we've, we've obtained more recently, others as well as uh, other adapter proteins as well, such as SHIC1, again, through SH2 domain recruitment, there seems to be a critical role for, uh, for recruitment of these adapters for, uh, again, uh, the a higher order um, uh, multivalent interactions that enable granule, a full granule assembly. So what is the role of the higher order assembly in, in, in signaling and, 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 and downstream uh, uh, effector recruitment and activation? We took advantage of our mutants that, that were, that were um, uh, in, uh, unable to, to form the granules. Again, the, in the case of the out, the trimerization domain or health domain mutant or the kinase domain mutant. Um, and, we, and, and a system developed by Jacques Kun Chu, uh, another colleague at UCSF and a close collaborator, where um, essentially uh, using a, a system of hexameric and tetrameric tags that his lab engineered called the hot tag system. Uh, one can essentially um, uh, cause higher order multimerization of any protein matrix, essentially. Um, and so we went back to our mutants that are unable to form granules in the newest data. I'm not showing those data here. I just showed them a couple of slides ago. And we, uh, and, and we simply um, uh, inserted the, the hot tag, engineered the hot tag onto these mutants of the mfr alpha. And so when we do that, um, as predicted, uh, we can form uh, the granules. So now here's the kinase domain mutant that without the hotag doesn't form, and now forming um, uh, uh, granules. Same for the trimerization domain mutant, same for the health domain mutant. And these look very much like, um, you know, like the wild type um, uh, the native animal for our granules. And now uh, when, when we force cluster using the hot tag system, uh, these mutants, we now see 
uh, uh, recapitulate uh, or restore recruitment of gratitude to the millennials, and that's shown here and here for these two mutants. Not so for the kinase to mutant, again, uh, suggesting that the kinase activity is required for gratitude. Not surprising that this is required for the SH2 uh, of gratitude to bind to the phosphotyrosine. Um, so this is a specific sort of signaling um, effector engagement. And, um, and what's the effect on signaling? That's shown here. Um, what we in fact found was that uh, when one restores uh, granular formation from using the high-tech system, uh, one can uh, now restore signaling. Um, and so here's a, a wild tap amyloid up signaling, for example, um, uh, through phosphor ERK here. Um, and the Western's on, on the left, quantification's on the right. Um, I'll just go through the quantification here uh, for ease of view. So the Delta TV mutant uh, uh, has a relatively low level of phosphor ERK. This is significantly augmented by the, by, by the hot tag system, and the same is true for the help domain. And again, not, not true for the kinase domain, um, given that this is an active signaling, um, uh, active signaling event. So the formation of these granules is, is actually required for, um, for, for, um, for full uh, pathway output. So is this a potentially um, uh, a more generalizable uh, phenomenon, or is this just a peculiar sort of mechanism by which these, you know, EMF or ALK RTK fusions function? We conducted a series of additional uh, experiments to start to address that question. This question is still an active area of investigation in our lab and hopefully other labs there as well now. Uh, but we, um, uh, as a principal experiment, um, initially, um, generated a truncated form of, of EGFR, uh, where we remove the transmembrane domain and the extracellular domain, analogous is what happens in RTK fusion, like ALK, like gamma for ALK. Um, and um, so this is essentially just the kinase domain and C-terminal tail of EGFR. So it is diffusely localized uh, under basal conditions, that's shown here. If we put the, uh, the hot tag system on it to, to, to um, potentially enable um, um, uh, um, uh, a granular uh, condensate formation or, or granular formation, we now can actually force cluster uh, trun this truncated kinase uh, uh, domain of EGFR. And you can see an example here. When we do that, we actually get recruitment of GRAB2 in situ at, at these uh, cytoplasmic uh, uh, structures, suggesting again that even in the context of, of, the, of the kinase domain of EGFR, force clustering is sufficient to drive, um, uh, to drive uh, effector uh, uh, recruitment. And in fact, it's also sufficient, as shown down here, to initiate sigma. So here is um, again, that, that internal or IDE GFR force cluster here, uh, uh, no, no force cluster in blue, force cluster in red. You can see a significant augmentation of, of phosphor work here just upon clustering of the kinase domain in the cytoplasm uh, in this context. And um, as a negative control, uh, we also had engineered a kinase impaired form of, of EGFR, this mutant, just like uh, lysine mutant here, and, and, and no, um, no grad two recruitment not shown and, and no uh, phosphor work. Um, uh, either again, suggesting that in, in this more generalized system, uh, this is sort of an active signaling event again in situ um, in the cytoplasm. So, what is the functional importance of higher order protein assembly? And, and I already alluded to uh, a, a, a concept I'm going to discuss here uh, on the next couple of slides. There are actually different forms of RTK fusions, um, even within a, a particular RTK. So, here are the three most common um, uh, forms of, of EMF or ALK fusions. The, the most common one is the one I've been showing you data for, uh, variant one. There's also a variant three or B3 and a, a variant five, B5. These are a little less common. And so we simply, add, and, and, and the interesting um, aspect of these is that the, the kinase domain uh, uh, is the same. They all lack the transmembrane domain of the native ALK. Um, and they, they just vary by, by the uh, uh, components and nature of the EMF or ALK external partner. Here. So you can see the different uh, aspects. Um, so the variant five is the smallest. It just contains the trimerization domain. Variant three contains the trimerization domain and only a small portion of this help domain. And variant one contains uh, essentially the, the full complement here, as I've been showing you. So variant one forms granules. Variant three forms granules as well, uh, this intermediate form. Variant five does not. Again, suggesting as our early experiments had, had alluded to, suggesting that, that it really is the multivalency that's, uh, that's, um, uh, um, that's um, contributed by the N-terminal binding partner here that's, that's, that's important for, for, um, uh, for, uh, for, for full assembly. And, um, and, and this had signaling consequences. Um, so uh, 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 the uh, uh, forms that, that form granules readily, variant one and variant three, actually activated not kind of signaling here by, by measuring phosphor ERK here, um, more potently than, than, variant, uh, than variant five. And this actually aligns with human genetics. Uh, the most, again, most common form uh, that's selected for in cancers is variant one followed by variant three. These activate the, the pathway more robustly. 
Variant five is very infrequent in, 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 in human cancer, although it, it, it does exist, uh, but much less frequent than these other variants. And then uh, this is certainly correlated with um, this decreased potency of path reactivation um, in the absence of granular formation. So we think there's a, a, a very important um, a functional role in, in cancer for, uh, for, for granular formation in this context. What are the different, or are there different biophysical properties um, in, in, in this granular system? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are for other forms of uh, biomolecular condensates, you know, the, the, the properties can vary even within one system. And so um, here's a, uh, uh, an experiment where we simply measured the mobile fraction of granules and cells just by, by, by uh, monitoring their movement. And in fact, we found that variant one is relatively immobile. So it, it's, it moves and it's, uh, it, um, it does transit, but very, um, you know, very um, uh, slowly and, and much less frequently. Uh, very, um, and variant three actually is, is more mobile. Um, so suggesting that it might be a little bit more uh, uh, liquid-like than the more solid-like nature of, of that variant one protein. And in fact, that's also reflected in the FRAP tracings. So here's variant three. If you recall, variant one was uh, had a very, very slow recovery. Variant three is, um, is also relatively slow compared to other granular systems um, uh, that, that, are, that are more liquid-like. Uh, but but much more um, much more liquid like than um, than the solid like nature of variant one. So so even in this in this set of examples here, uh, there are different uh, 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 yeah, different uh, cell biological and biophysical properties of, of these different granules. How are these? Uh, one other interesting question um, that arose uh, is how are these different RT and K fusion granule assemblies regulated? Not, not only from the formation aspect, which uh, which uh, we discussed a few minutes ago, um, but but also through the um, uh, through, through their um, uh, through through their um, uh, turnover, the re regulated turnover, uh, or is there a regulated turnover? And so one um, um, one uh, hypothesis that we tested is: Are, are these regulated by um, uh, by protein turnover systems uh, that are involved in classic RTK re recycling or, or, or turnover, um, such as uh, proteasomal regulation or autophagy? Uh, we found that, in fact, in the case of the MFR outbringers, they're regulated by autophagy, and there's a lot of data here uh, showing that. But I'll just point a, a on a couple of key experiments. So if we inhibit autophagy using established chemical inhibitors like chloroquine or baclomycin, we actually find that um, this the inhibition of autophagy increases the number of granules. It also increases the size of the granules in cells. And you can might maybe appreciate that from the, um, from the um, images here. Um, so this is the, these are the native EMF rock granules on the left. This is chloroquine, this is baclomycin. So you can see increased numbers and increased size of granules. Again, this is suggesting um, that uh, that um, that autophagy is is, is um, essentially um, uh, uh, promoting granule um, uh, turnover and, and and restricting the growth of these granules beyond a certain size. I mean, interestingly, if um, if if we um, inhibit autophagy, not only are, are granule these granules augmented in in, in those ways, uh, this also activates signaling. So it further actually um, promotes um, uh, uh, EMF4 signaling. That's shown here by phospho-alk levels uh, as well as phospho-erk levels here under treatment with chloroquine or, or baclomycin just on these Western plants. So these data suggested that in fact, um, uh, uh, there are two things. One is that autophagy regulates the turnover of these granules. And two, uh, that these are, 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 are very active signaling complexes in fact. Um, and, and if you grow them further, um, you can further activate uh, downstream signaling, suggesting again that the higher order multivalent protein assembly network in, in, at these granules or in these granules uh, is, is critical for, for oncogenic signaling, that these are not dead aggregates uh, of, of protein. So how, how, how generalizable beyond um, uh, ALK and, and, um, and, and the contrived EGFR system I showed you earlier is this? Well, um, the reason why that's an interesting question is that um, many RTK fusions in cancer not only many flavors of ALK gene fusions, but, but many others that are well-validated cancer drivers, such as uh, another RTK RET fusions. Uh, again, um, this is a validated target in lung cancer, colon cancer, and others. One common shared structural feature that is that by virtue of the chromosomal rearrangement that occurs for, uh, across these different RTK fusions and, and others as well, they almost always, not always, but, but, but very frequently, almost always, lose the transmembrane domain and are fused to an N-terminal protein that contains oligomerization or protein-protein um, uh, or multimerization domains. And so, um, uh, so here are a few of the examples of, of, of ALK. So here's, I showed you EMF4 ALK um, containing, uh, uh, you know, containing um, uh, a certain multimerization domains like the trimerization domain in this context. Um, there are other uh, fusion partners such as KIF5B. This is a protein that contains uh, several coral coral domains. Again, a well-established 
um, uh, protein protein interaction domain. Same is true for red fusions. So, for example, KIF5B and, and CCDC6, these contain coral coral domains uh, as well as other protein interaction domains. And so we be, we've begun to now uh, ask whether this is a, a more generalized mechanism of RTK fusion uh, oncogenesis. Uh, and this is just a conceptual paradigm of, of the internal partner here containing multi immunization domains of different, of different uh, subtypes. So here is a common RET gene fusion that, that drives cancer, uh, CCDC6. This contains again coral coral domains. So in fact, um, we find that CCDC6 forms granules analogous to emf 4 alpha This recruits GRAB2 in situ um, to the, in the cytoplasm. And this can also activate, um, uh, this can also activate RAS in situ there by virtue of that RAS UTP reporter. So very similar behavior to the emf 4 alpha system, although again, different kinase and different N-terminal protein. Um, it turns out that um, that, that, that protein granule formation uh, um, is, is required uh, for, uh, again, similar to ALK, for um, uh, downstream signaling. So if we mutate the coral coral domain that, that presumably mediates um, uh, for protein protein assembly here, um, we diminish uh, activation of, 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 of RAS here by RAS UTP levels as well as a uh, phospho work. Um, and similar when we mutate the, the kinase domain uh, uh, of, uh, of CCDC6 met here as well. Interestingly, when we mutate the kinase domain, and I'm not showing these data um, in, in these slides, but when we mutate the kinase domain over at, it, it behaved differently from emf and and uh, this mutant still formed granules. And so um, what I'm going to show you in a slide or two is a bit more mechanistic data as to, the, um, as to what might be some of the rules of assembly for different granule systems. Um, and so uh, it turns out that in the, case of, um, in the case of RET, all that's required for granule formation um, at least in the context of, 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 of the fusion oncoprotein, is the coral coral domain. Um, and so uh, to prove that further, uh, we simply did uh, uh, conducted a swapping experiments. So now if we take CCDC6 and fuse it to ALK, uh, this forms granules, as, might, as you might expect. Uh, and now if we mutate, the, if we mutate the, the, uh, the, the kinase of ALK here now in the context of this different fusion partner, CCDC6, uh, that we still form granules, the granules are still formed. So again, suggesting that that the, there's a very important role for the, the character of the multi-immunization domains in the N-terminal partner. Conversely, if we now take EMO4 and fuse it to RET and make a kinase domain mutant, first, the wild type forms granules readily. Um, and second, the kinase domain mutant is now diffusely localized. So, so uh, EMO4 itself is insufficient to form granules and requires uh, an active kinase partner, presumably because, as I explained earlier, um, uh, uh, there's a requirement for, for increased um, uh, multivalency through effector uh, binding, such as GRAB2. And so, um, and, and this had signaling consequences, um, so uh, uh, as one might predict. So, uh, when granules, um, uh, so granule formation was essential for signaling in these different systems, as, as I showed you for EMO4, native emf 4 out previously. So, this led to on the bottom here, a, a sort of a, a working model that we're continuing to investigate in the context of these fusions and other RTK fusions now as well. And that there's a certain threshold for granule formation um, and then therefore downstream oncogenic signaling of different, of different magnitudes. And that um, th there's at least two classes of, of, of granule uh, assembly rules. One is a kinase dependent example, and, and this is um, uh, exemplified by emf 4 alp uh, This requires not only the multi-immunization domains in the, in the N-terminal partner, but also, again, um, uh, recruitment of effectors such as GRAB2 to, to increase um, uh, the, uh, to, to meet the threshold for, for RTK granule formation. In the case of, um, of CCDC6 and this particular partner, uh, this is sufficient for granule formation. And therefore, the kinase, domain is, uh, the kinase activity is not required. Um, GRAB2, for example, is not required in this context. And so again, we're continuing to, to, um, uh, to further characterize the, the rules of assembly um, in, in this paradigm. And, and perhaps there'll be some additional, uh, I'm sure there'll be some additional twists uh, and, and turns uh, moving forward. So in the last minute or two, I just wanted to share with you some of our other work um, for further characterizing the, the components of these guys. And we've taken very much sort of a, a, a systems-based approach here of, uh, through a different um, proteomics and, and, and other approaches to identify what are the signaling proteins that are localized in, 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 in the ALK granules as well as REC granules. And I uh, won't dwell on this a lot today. This is still ongoing work. But essentially, we found that many canonical signaling proteins um, that participate in lipid membrane-based RTK signaling are localized at these granules. So for example, GRAB2, I showed you already, SHIC, uh, PLC gamma, IRS1, SOS1, SHIP2, GAB, and, and others. Um, and these essentially, um, many of these can associate with um, the EMO4 out uh, 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 through co-IP experiments, 
um, in a granule specific manner. So here's co-IPs with many of these candidates with wild type EMO4 elk, but not with the trimerizations in the mutants in EMO4 that abrogates granular formation. So again, the granules are required for interaction um, and also for, um, uh, for recruitment. And here's just some images showing recruitment of these signaling proteins, RAB2, SHIG, and others to these, uh, to these uh, EMO4 elk granules. Similar for, for the CCD6 red fusions, there are uh, of a very similar complement of proteins recruited, although not identical. Um, and so uh, there, there are some interesting distinctions, which I won't dwell on today, but, uh, but I just show these data um, again to uh, emphasize that these, um, uh, that, that these RTK fusions are recruiting many of the canonical effectors um, as, 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 as conventional signal. So um, I hope what I've convinced you today, or, or, or if not, I'd be delighted to, to, uh, to discuss further, is that in addition to lipid membrane-based compartments, it, it, it seems as though, as exemplified by plasma membrane RTK signaling that, that, that organizes, um, uh, that is a very important uh, mechanism of organizing native and oncogenic signaling in, in cancer, cells can use a, a different mechanism uh, of these membranous cytoplasmic protein granules in the context of RTK fusion proteins uh, to, um, to, 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 uh, to organize uh, this biological process of, of oncogenic signaling down the RAS pathway and potentially other signaling pathways as well. This raises an interesting therapeutic possibility. Um, and, and as a clinician scientist, uh, as, as Walter alluded to, we, we certainly um, uh, you know, focus on mechanism, but, but if there's a, a way also to connect it uh, to, to potential clinical translation and improve cancer therapies, um, uh, um, uh, certainly an, an important goal as well. Uh, this raises a possibility that we could um, uh, identify uh, um, uh, 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 targeted inhibitors that might act um, distinctly against RTK fusion microbiotes from current FDA-approved drugs, such as ATP-competitive alkinase inhibitors or RET kinase inhibitors. Uh, and in principle, one might be able to identify small molecules that actually act um, through, um, not, not through inhibition of kinase activity per se, but through formation of granule, protein granule assembly by interfering with the di various determinants that I shared with you are important for granule assembly, such as uh, EMO4 um, multimerization or GRAB2 uh, uh, binding, uh, for example. And so we're uh, entertaining this possibility and testing this hypothesis now. So with that, I'll close with uh, just a couple of future direction uh, notes. So uh, again, we're continuing to, to use um, a variety of, of, of more unbiased approaches now to identify components of the different granule systems. We are conducting in vitro biochemistry with Mike Rosen's group at UT Southwestern, who's really a cognizant um, uh, uh, pioneer. Uh, to, to understand um, the, the, uh, on a more reductionist level, the, the bio, biochemical properties and biophysical properties of these different granular systems. Uh, we're um, examining uh, isoform specificity in, in effectors. We have some preliminary data I didn't share with you that, that there may be different isoforms of RAS or, or RAF um, that are uh, participating in, 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 um, uh, in, uh, in, in granule-based signal. Um, uh, are there differences amongst different oncogenic RTK fusions and in, 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 you know, in, in, um, in their signaling outputs? And, and might there be a role for, um, for cytoplasmic um, signaling in certain uh, uh, physiologic contexts of RTKs? Um, what are the downstream pathways? I already alluded to this earlier. And again, granule disruption, uh, physical granule disruption as a potential therapeutic strategy. So with that, I'll close by acknowledging many people in my lab um, who contributed to this work, and most notably the, the folks here on the right, Bo Wong at UCSF and his postdoc, uh, Juan, as well as a, a super talented um, former postdoc in my lab who now has his own group, Osman Kapule, uh, and a former talent, a very, uh, again, very talented former MSTP student in my lab who's now a resident in Boston, uh, Dana Neal, who really all drove this, this project forward. Um, and with that, I'm, uh, thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to, to take questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Trevor, for this really fascinating. I think we lost you, Walter. Uh oh. Hello. I think we may have lost Walter for a second. Um, but we've got some questions in the Q and A box. Um, thank you, Trevor. I think that's what uh, Walter was trying to say. Okay. Um, but thank you for that great talk. So. I'll go with the first uh, question here in the Q&A box from Boris, um, who's our deputy director at SBI. It says, there are numerous reports that MAPK signaling is facilitated by endocytosis. Uh, can you please explain that using your suggested mechanism? 
Thank you for the question, Boris. Um, yes, uh, certainly um, endos endocytosis can regulate RTK and, and that kind of pathway signaling um, and, and maybe facilitating uh, pathway signaling. Um, in, in the context of, of these pro RTK protein granules, um, you know, we have no evidence that these are lipid membrane um, based structures uh, and, and that they interact with endosomes, although it is, it is a possibility. We haven't really examined that um, closely, whether the RTK protein granules that don't contain membranes, you know, might be in some way um, uh, in physical contact uh, with, with, with endosomes by, by some mechanism. Um, but we have no evidence to suggest there is a direct interaction at this point. Okay. Um, we'll just go on down the line. Uh, David Gomez. Hi, thanks for the talk. I have many questions, but one doubt I have if this me membraneless structures are related to the liquid-liquid phase separation states that reported, or these are different. Thank you for um, the question. Yeah, David. Thank you for the question. Um, so the, the you know these are these are a form of phase separated compartments. You know there there are many right that that have now been reported and in, in increasing uh, reports of, of you know various uh, proteins and structures. Um, so these are a form of phase separated um, uh, uh, condensate. Um, they are not very liquid like. They are on the spectrum of more solid like in terms of their character. But yes, these these are an, exa an example of a phase separated compartment. Exactly. Okay. Um, back to Boris, what is the advantage of granule-based RTK signaling compared to membrane-localized RTK-driven signaling? Good question. I, you know, I don't know that there is an advantage. Um, I just think this is a distinct mechanism um, by which cells can organize oxygen signaling. This certainly, um, you know, is, does not discount any important role for, um, for RTK, lipid membrane-based signaling. I mean, that's, it's critically important in physiologic signaling as well as, in, uh, as, well as in oxygenic signaling. Um, uh, so I, I, you know, I don't think there's any um, disadvantage or advantage to either system. I think we've just uncovered a, you know, a, a, um, a different way that's that in the context of these fusions, because of the, their structural rearrangement and their, um, you know, their their, um, their 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 properties that they just they don't associate with the membranes, and, and so they they self-assemble. So we think it's just distinct, not not necessarily better than. Great. Um... Back to David, they're kind of volleying back and forth here. David, also curious if all RAS isoforms in RAS-less structure localize or is only KRAS? And finally, are RAS lipid modifications involved in this organization? Thank you, David. Um, so, you know, we, we believe that all RAS isoforms are involved. Um, you know, I, we were just, um, for our mechanistic experiments, we were, you know, using the, the KRAS allele. Um, uh, but um, you know, they're in, in principle, all RAS proteins are localized in the cytoplasm at one time, so H and KRAS. And so, um, but to answer your question directly, um, uh, you know, uh, we, um, you know, we're still investigating more directly, you know, which RAS isoforms are, are there, as I alluded to in the future directional slide. Um, in terms of the lipid modifications, uh, good question. We don't know. Those are experiments that we're, you know, conducting. Um, you know, uh, presently. Um, it, it certainly seems as though they're not required because if you remember the CAC cysteine mutant that doesn't, is not lipid modified, still participates in signaling, but, but of course that's, that's engineered and, and not native. Um, so, you know, we're, we're examining, um, you know, the role of lipid modifications um, uh, and, and, you know, the role, if any, in, in the granular based signal. I see Walter's back. Walter, I'll yeah, pass so it back it's... over to you. Um, we've got a question from Matthew Callahan. So it's, if you want to have a look and pick up where I left off. Yeah, sorry, my internet kicked out. Uh, I actually can't, my Q&A box is empty as well. Oh. So I... I <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and read I, it. I had, a, I had a total internet failure. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay, Matthew, um, in the case of CCDC6 fusions, what do you think is the mechanism of downstream effector recruitment, if not recognition, of autophosphorylated tails. Okay. Um, oh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, let me see if I understand your question. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, yes. Let, let me um, let me maybe re-explain. So the um, the CCDC CCD six C six red fusions. Um, uh, uh, the 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 uh, effective recruitment does require the autophosphorylated tails. What 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 the um, the difference between with ALK is that um, uh, the kinase domain is not required for granule formation per se, um, but but that's not to say that the kinase, the phosphorylated uh, tails uh, are, are are not required for effector recruitment. They are so very so very similar. So you need the phosphorylated tails to to recruit effectors and initiate signaling. You just don't need it in the context of RET for the formation of the granule. Okay, 
Okay, then we've got Emily Venanzi. Uh, hopefully I said that right. What are the functional implications of the more liquid-like granules B3 versus the less liquid-like ones B1? Yeah, thank you, Emily, for the question. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, you know, we're continuing to examine that. Uh, it, uh, it's unclear. They both seem to activate um, at least the MAP kinase pathway, you know, to a similar degree, um, although there, there could be differences in other pathways, but it's, that's something we're continuing to investigate. Okay, and it looks like we have a comment again from Boris saying an advantage is that when granules are closer to the nucleus than the cytoplasm, the gradients of phospho-ERK from the cytoplasm of the nucleus are more shallow. Um, Oh, interesting comment. Thank you, Boris. That's certainly possible. Yeah, we have not measured that, but that certainly would, could be interesting to examine. That was our last question. I'll hand it back to you, Walter, unless there's more questions to pop up. Yeah, I mean, it, it's actually, I really enjoyed the talk. It was fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, I missed most of the discussion, but the uh, this question may have been asked, but, you know, John Hancock had the story with the nanoclusters that you have to have, I think it was exactly seven RAS proteins mm -hmm. and they form very stoichiometrically elaborate structures to get signaling. Yes. Uh, how does this reconcile with the uh, like granules where you just seem to have oligomerization and that does the trick? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, obviously the, 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 the rules of, of signaling could be different in liquid membranes versus mm -hmm. you know, protein granules. Um, it, that's probably the most likely possibility. Although I, you know, I do think in principle, it's a similar, you know, it's, it's a similar um, uh, set of observations in, in the sense that, um, you know, there must be a stoichiometric engagement to initiate not only granular formation, but also downstream you know, activation of RAS and, and signaling. Those are, those are experiments that we're trying to conduct with Mike Rosen in vitro, as well as um, in, in, in our cell-based uh, systems as well, um, to try to understand what is the what, what is the stoichiometry that's involved from these various signaling proteins? And what's the concentration of, of, of each of these proteins in not only in cells, um, but also how does that affect um, granule formation or even signaling in a, in a test tube? And so uh, uh, the, the short answer is we don't know yet. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah, Thank, thanks a lot. Um, so I guess we can conclude the seminar. Absolute fantastic talk. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you and very much. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you all. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.